My name is Kaylee, and in this video I'm going to tell you all about the famous Piltdown Man discovery that occurred back in 1912, which was a hoax, which lasted for 41 years until it was definitively exposed as a forgery in 1953. So let's start with taking a look at the supposed discovery and how this led up to become the greatest hoax in paleoanthropology. So on December 18th, 1912, at a meeting of the Geological Society of London, Charles Dawson claimed that a workman at the Piltdown gravel pit near Piltdown village in Sussex, England, had given him a fragment of a skull four years earlier in 1908. The workman at the site discovered the skull shortly before Dawson's visit to the site and broke it up as they believed it was a fossilized coconut. A fossilized coconut in England. Why? Dawson then revisited the site multiple times and found further fragments of the skull. He then wrote to Arthur Smith Woodward, who was the keeper of geology at the Natural History Museum in London at the time. So they started working together between June and September, and while Woodward accompanied him to the site, the further recovered skull fragments and half of the lower jaw were found only by Dawson. So, back in 1912, amateur archaeologist Charles Dawson claimed that he had discovered the missing link between ape and man, as he claimed he was in possession of part of a human-like skull that was discovered in Pleistocene gravel beds. At the same meeting, Woodward did announce that a reconstruction of the fragments indicated that the skull was, in many ways, similar to that of a modern human, except for the part of the skull that sits on the spinal column. And the brain size was smaller, about two-thirds of a modern human, according to his reconstruction. However, Woodward told the Geological Society of London that apart from two human-like molars, the jawbone was indistinguishable from that of a modern young chimpanzee. The British Museum, along with Woodward, had reconstructed the skull and Woodward proposed that Piltdown Man represented an evolutionary missing link between apes and humans because of the combination of the human-like skull with an ape-like jaw, including ape-like canine teeth. Although these canines weren't yet found at the time, this just, you know, he added that, and all of this supported the prevailing notion in England at the time that human evolution started with the brain. Almost from the start, Woodward's reconstruction of Piltdown Man fragments were strongly challenged by some researchers. So copies of the same fragments used by the British Museum's reconstruction, along with Woodward, uh, were used by the Royal College of Surgeons, and they created an entirely different reconstruction. Their reconstruction was more like modern humans, like the brain size and other features. So Professor Arthur Keith named this reconstruction from the Royal College of Surgeons Homo Piltdownensis in reflection of its more human-like appearance. The discovery was considered legitimate by Professor Otto Schutensack, who had discovered the Heidelberg fossils just a few years earlier, and he described Piltdown Man as being the best evidence for an ape-like ancestor of modern humans. Boy, was he wrong! In August of 1913, Woodward, Dawson, and French paleontologist and geologist Pierre Taillard de Chardin began a systematic search of the spoil heaps at the Piltdown gravel pit in search for the missing canines. Teilhard de Chardin discovered a canine that, according to Woodward, fitted the jaw perfectly. But a few days later, Teilhard de Chardin went back to France and did not take further part in the discoveries. He actually removed himself from it. 
Woodward noted that the discovered canine corresponded exactly with that of an ape, and he expected this find to put an end to any dispute over his reconstruction of the skull. But what he didn't expect was Professor Sir Arthur Keith attacking the find, as Keith explained that human molars are the result of side-to-side -side movement when chewing. And the canine that Woodward claimed to have belonged in the Piltdown Man jaw was impossible to belong there as it prevented the side-to-side -side movement. When it's, you know, in the way, it doesn't work. The only logical explanation for Keith for the wear on the molar teeth would mean that the canine couldn't have been any higher than the molars. But a fellow anthropologist, Grafton Elliot Smith, sided with Woodward and at the next Royal Society meeting claimed that Keith's opposition was only the result of Keith's ambition, which subsequently ended the long friendship between Keith and Smith. David Waterston, a Scottish surgeon and anatomist of King's College London, published in 1913 in Nature his conclusion that the sample consisted of an ape, mandible, and human skull. And this was actually corroborated by French paleontologist Marceline Boulle. American zoologist Gerrit Smith Miller Jr. concluded that Piltdown Man's jaw came from a fossil's ape as well in 1915. He stated that deliberate malice could hardly have been more successful than the hazards of deposition in so breaking the fossils as to give free scope to individual judgment in fitting the parts together. I mean, those are very strong words. Later in 1915, Dawson claimed that he found three fragments of a second Piltdown Man skull at a new site, approximately 3,200 meters, which equates to roughly two miles, away from the original site. And this site is known as Sheffield Park. Woodward attempted numerous times to receive the exact location from Dawson, but he was unsuccessful. And therefore, the exact location has actually never been identified, and this new discovery of Dawson was mostly undocumented. However, Woodward presented these new finds to the Royal Society in August of 1916, which occurred approximately five months after the death of Dawson. And Woodward even implied that he knew where they were found, even though, like I just mentioned, he never knew the exact location. Then, in 1921, President of the American Museum of Natural History, Henry Fairfield Osborne, examined the Piltdown and Sheffield Park finds and declared that without question, the jaw and the skull belonged together. So the Sheffield Park finds were taken as proof of the authenticity of Piltdown Man, as it may have been chance that brought an ape's jaw and a human skull together, but the odds for it happening twice were very slim. Even Professor Sir Arthur Keith at this point conceded to this new evidence, although he still harbored his own personal doubts. In 1923, German anatomist and physical anthropologist Franz Weidenreich examined the remains and reported that they consisted of a modern human cranium and an orangutan jaw with filed down teeth. From the start, as I mentioned earlier, some scholars expressed skepticism about Piltdown Man. And thank God they did! So at this point in time, about 11 years after the announcement of Piltdown Man to the world, there were four scholars who publicly concluded that the skull and the jaw did not belong to one single species, but that the cranium belonged to a modern human and that the jaw was from an ape as Frans Weidenreich correctly reported, of an orangutan. In the decades before Piltdown Man was exposed as a hoax in 1953, scientists increasingly regarded Piltdown Man as an enigmatic aberration, inconsistent with the path of hominin evolution as demonstrated by fossil finds elsewhere. It wasn't until November of 1953 nearly 41 years after its first announcement, 
when Time published evidence gathered by British physical anthropologist and paleontologist Kenneth Page Oakley, British anatomist, surgeon, primatologist and paleoanthropologist Sir Wilfred Edward Le Gros Clark, and British human biologist Joseph Weiner, which proved once and for all that Piltdown Man was a forgery, as they demonstrated that the Piltdown Man fossil was a composite of three distinct species. The Piltdown Man fossil consisted of a human skull from the medieval age, the 500-year-old lower jaw of an orangutan, and chimpanzee fossil teeth. The appearance of age on the fossils was created by someone who stained the bones with an iron solution and chromic acid. Microscopic examination revealed file marks on the teeth as someone had modified the teeth to a shape more suited to a human diet. The reason that the Piltdown Man hoax succeeded so well at the time of its discovery and for such a long time afterwards had everything to do with the scientific community believing that the large modern brain preceded the modern omnivorous diet and this forgery proved exactly that evidence. So the identity of the Piltdown Man forger remains unknown to this day. Although suspects, as you can imagine, have included Dawson himself. So the reason of the focus on Charles Dawson being the main forger is supported by the accumulation of evidence regarding other archaeological hoaxes he perpetrated in the decade or two before the Piltdown Man discovery. And he also wanted to be recognized as an archaeologist and not just an amateur. Archaeologist Miles Russell of Bournemouth University analyzed Dawson's antiquarian collection and he actually determined that at least 38 of his specimens were fakes. Among these specimens were the teeth of an extinct rodent-like mammal that was named Plagiola Dawsoni that Dawson discovered in 1891 and the teeth of this specimen were filed down in the same way as the teeth of Piltdown Man were filed down some, you know, 20 years later. In 2016, the result of an eight-year-long investigation of the Piltdown Man forgery was released, identifying Charles Dawson's mode of operating as multiple specimen in his possession demonstrated the same consistent preparation, application of the stain, packing of crevices with local gravel, and fixation of the teeth and gravel with dentist putty. Yeah, Dawson, you done fucked up, dude. Analysis of the shape and trace DNA showed that teeth from both the Piltdown and Sheffield Park sites actually belonged to the same orangutan individual. Now that's gold. The consistent method and common source indicated the work of one person on all specimens. And since Dawson was the only one associated with the Sheffield Park finds, he is the only common denominator. Although the authors of the 2016 paper did not rule out the possibility that someone else had provided some of the false fossils to Dawson that he later used in his forgeries. They may not have known that it was going to be used in a forgery, but yeah, you know. The Piltdown Man fraud affected early research on human evolution immensely, as it led scientists down a never-ending rabbit hole in the belief that the human brain expanded size before the jaw adapted to the new types of food. Other discoveries of fossils, such as the Australopithecine fossils like the Tong Child, found by Australian anatomist and anthropologist Raymond Dart during the 1920s in South Africa, were ignored due to the support of Piltdown Man as the missing link, and reconstructions of human evolution was confused for many decades. I do want to note one kind of fun thing, that L. Ron Hubbard, you know, the creator of Scientology, actually featured Piltdown Man as a phase of biological history capable of leaving a person with subconscious memories of traumatic incidents that can only be resolved by the use of science 
Technology, technology, in his book Scientology, A History of Man. Damn you, Ron Hubbard. The recovered memories of this phase, according to Hubbard, are prompted by the obsession with biting, hiding the teeth, or the mouth. According to him, this appeared to be related to the large jaw of the Piltdown Man specimen. Of course, a science fiction novelist will come up with stuff like this. His book Scientology A History of Man was released in 1952, just one year before the Piltdown Man fraud was confirmed, although for many decades there were doubts about Piltdown Man. And Hubbard actually never rectified this in his book, and neither has anyone else in the Scientology community rectified this, as the book has been republished five times, with the most recent republication occurring in 2007. It's estimated that more than 250 papers have been written on the topic of Piltdown Man since its discovery, which is just an insane amount of papers on one single subject. But at the same time, these papers were absolutely necessary for the truth to come to light. Thankfully, science and the understanding of human evolution has advanced greatly since the Piltdown Man hoax, and I honestly don't think a similar hoax could occur in our time. I mean, they can try, but you know. <laughs> so my question to you, my viewers, is this. What do you think of the Piltdown Man hoax? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, and click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload, as I have a massive Neanderthal documentary dropping very soon. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner, or click one of the links in the description down below, or click a video in the end card. I mean, whatever floats your boat, and whatever you'd like to see. I would also like to say a massive thank you to all my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so much for supporting me and my work and my passion and this journey that I'm making into the human evolutionary timeline and all the hoaxes. I have very much enjoyed making this video. It's um, fun and sad at the same time, actually, because Piltdown Man really really messed up the evolutionary research of, you know, us humans for quite a long time. And I'm glad that it was eventually exposed as a forgery. Like I said earlier, I am going to drop a massive Neanderthal documentary, a complete guide into the species of Neanderthals. Everything that you can imagine will be in there. Yeah, let's just say it's gonna be filled with a lot of information. I'm calling it a complete guide to the species. So um, yeah, I hope to finish it within a week. But honestly, like my birthday is coming up on November 14 and the weekend prior to it, I will be away for four days with my boyfriend, which is gonna be fun but that means that I won't be able to work on it. So either I can finish it beforehand or have to make a quick, quick video on something else in between and then drop it the week later, but it is coming within like two or three weeks. So sit tight and I'll make sure that I've got it uploaded and all set up like two or three days prior to the premiere. So everyone has the chance to be able to be there. Like maybe you can switch something up in your agendas. I don't know, cause it's gonna be a long ride. It's definitely gonna be like an hour long. So yeah, Neanderthal documentary coming soon. Gonna see you there. <laughs> but for now, uh, this is my video on Piltdown Man and the greatest hoax in anthropology. And I'll see you next time. Bye.